Do I even need to introduce Smash Mouth? Like, you're watching this on the internet, presumably, so you definitely know about them by this point. But let's be honest, most of us don't really know them. For those of you new to the channel, ever since a documentary I made a few years ago, I've been half-ironically hyper-fixated on Smash Mouth. I mean, I'm more invested than most, I guess. Whether it's because due to their looming status as a punching bag, both in online circles, from them being reduced to quotes from a single song that's now incapable of being taken seriously, as well as the general rock ecosystem, from their oversaturation at the height of their popularity, they're a band often not respected enough to have much depth of fan base, and thus a lack of in-depth centralized information regarding them. Or because of autism, I've been dedicating myself to learning about all the nooks and crannies of Smash Mouth's history. And one topic directly parallel to exploring obscurity, especially of well-known cultural figures, is the hunt for lost media. Published works whose existence or archival has been buried with the sands of time or unreleased material tantalizing enough to warrant knowing as much about it as possible. And believe it or not, there are actually a handful of examples of lost media from this band's history. In fact, this video won't even cover all of the ones I've found. Now, full disclosure, this video doesn't really have a point or a thesis. My last video was big and kind of annoying to make, so I felt like indulging myself a bit with an easier topic. Plus, I just think that these are some interesting stories about a band you probably didn't think had any. And I've learned that if I say anything confidently enough, you'll find it interesting too. So join me as we take a look at a handful of pieces of currently or previously lost media from the band Smash Mouth. Let's start off naturally by talking about lost music, and the first example here is the big one I'm sure you're already familiar with. If you've heard any murmurings of lost media about Smash Mouth, then you've definitely heard of their 2005 lost album, Old Habits. As the story goes, in between stops of their 2004 promotional tour for their previous album, Smash Mouth began recording their next release, with a handful of potential songs in the tracklist being revealed throughout its development. In May of 2005, the band officially revealed the album's title and and album art, with the pitch that the record will take the band back to its ska-punk roots seen on their debut album, as well as giving an official release date of summer of that year. However, this release date would be postponed a handful of times, despite a higher-profile televised performance to promote the record, which ironically also seems to be lost to time. They would release a limited-run Christmas cover CD to tide fans over, but eventually news for the album would halt completely. That is, until one of its singles would release and start garnering some radio play with the record attached now suspiciously referred to as Summer Girl. This Summer Girl album would officially release in September of 2006, with the members stating in later interviews that they had mostly scrapped old habits for being not perfect, before re-recording most of its songs in a more modern style for Summer Girl, as well as later in some solo material from other band members. One important thing to note is that by the time the band re-recorded songs for Summer Girl, old habits was fully recorded, so hypothetically the full versions of these original tracks could still be available. But for now, in the years after Summer Girl's release, and due to the band's lower profile, old habits would be silently forgotten by those of the general public who were aware of it. It wouldn't be until April of 2018 when someone would unearth this looming question. User It's Gallus would post a write-up onto the Lost Media Wiki subreddit, giving an overview on the album's history and cataloging the available versions of every known song, which would draw a bit more attention to the album. It was discovered soon after that Smash Mouth's publishing company, Spirit Music Group, had snippets of certain old habit songs unceremoniously uploaded to their public database, which did fill out some of the track list and give us some never-before-heard versions of these songs, but this would also be the only news regarding the story we'd hear for some time. It wouldn't be until four years later, in October of 2022, that we'd finally get closure to this search, and it came from an ironically unexpected place. According to the Lost Media Wiki, in April of 2020, a little over a week after Gallus's thread, a Discord user named Darlene had already sent a folder of the full versions of almost every track from Old Habits to the wiki's Discord server, and it had somehow just gone completely overlooked for two whole years. There are still at least three songs that, to my knowledge, we don't have the old versions of, but most people in the community were just excited for the search to have a conclusion, albeit in a somewhat embarrassing fashion. Old Habits is by far the biggest and most likely only lost 
media case regarding this band that people would have heard of. Having this be the first example isn't meant to be me getting it out of the way per se, it'd be weird if it wasn't here, but I'd personally rather highlight stories that haven't gotten that kind of attention already. Well, I guess this isn't technically the only big story, the closest thing to another big Smash Mouth case from the community is a song titled Love is a Soldier. It was released in July of 2016 as a collaboration with EDM producer Spectre, a figure no one aware of this song has been able to identify. And believe me, people were made aware. There were tons of articles published about how justifiably baffled people were at the thought of an EDM song featuring Smash Mouth. Love is a Soldier came out about three years after their previous single, and four years after the last single from any album. So that combined with the fact that the song was confusing and frankly not great led to it being incredibly unpopular with the band's fans. Most likely due to this backlash, along with the fact that the song didn't receive much attention after its initial release, the song would be quietly scrubbed from all official platforms sometime in early 2021. The last notable remnants of the song from the time were a guitar cover from 2017 by YouTube user Slippery Dad and a now unlisted Bad Shrek AMV of the song from 2016. In May of 2018, the song was brought to the Lost Media Wiki's attention by forum user SpaceThing7474, although the search would only last about two more hours when user Grigio Guy replied with a Google Drive link to the song and its lyric video. To be fair, it wouldn't be until June of 2022 before someone would upload it both to YouTube and the Internet Archive, but I guess the reason this story isn't talked about as much is just because it ended on such a quick anti-climax. But although it wasn't this long, gripping story for anyone's YouTube video, finding lost media is mainly about preservation at the end of the day. And surprisingly, Smash Mouth sort of have a track record for not preserving a lot of their more obscure history, since the band deleting things off platforms without notice from a lack of attention is gonna be a weird running theme throughout this video, as you'll soon see. The last semi-well-known example of Smash Mouth lost music will be taking us all the way back to the band's beginnings. As is well known by this point, Smash Mouth's first big hit was 1997's Walkin' on the Sun. The song was originally written by guitarist Greg Camp in response to the 1992 LA riots sparked by the beating of Rodney King by Los Angeles police, and lamented how the rising division and demonization of differing lifestyles is causing comfort among the masses to become a rarely obtained luxury. God, we really need a new Walkin' on the Sun, now more than ever. The demo of the song was made by Camp initially for the band he and bass player Paul Delisle were in before Smash Mouth named Lacka Daddy, performed as a rap and produced in a way that fit the band's hip-hop-infused punk rock style. But the other members of Lacka Daddy weren't fond of it, so Greg stashed away the demo tape somewhere and eventually forgot it existed. Later, after Smash Mouth formed and after the demo for their song Nervous in the Alley began getting significant radio play, bringing them unprecedented mainstream attention for an unsigned group, the band hunkered down on producing their debut album. Decently late into the recording process, the band's drummer Kevin Coleman found the Walkin' on the Sun tape in Camp's closet, and liked what he heard so much that the band was convinced to re-record it and put it on the upcoming record. And as you may recall, Walkin' on the Sun was similarly leaked to local radio stations, and the song single-handedly launched Smash Mouth into the behemoth they ended up becoming, arguably being the biggest factor in why their eventual debut album went multi-platinum. All that being said, with how important Walkin' on the Sun was for getting Smash Mouth's foot in the door of the industry, it's kinda surprising that, despite them releasing an EP of demos in 1999, which even included the Nervous and the Alley demo that got them on the radio, and despite some Lack of Daddy material being released over time by people affiliated with the band, it's kinda weird that the original Walkin' on the Sun demo was never released by the band. It seems like an obvious decision, but the demo has never resurfaced in the over 20 years since it became a point of interest in the history of the band. Now this can only technically be considered lost media, more so unreleased since it's just a thing that we know about that hasn't been made public yet. And this isn't a call to action to pester the band about this either, or have anything else to talk about here for the record. I'm sure this video is the most attention a lot of these stories have gotten already. This bit was just me pointing out that the band never thought about releasing this demo and then going, Hmm. There are a handful of other lost songs I want to talk about before I get to the one I'm real excited to cover, and these ones don't require as much backstory, fortunately. In June of 2001, MTV reported that Smash Mouth was entering the studio with progressive soul songwriter George Clinton to record a song titled Spooky Thing for their then-upcoming self-titled album. Spooky Thing didn't make it onto that album, though it isn't lost, since it later appeared as a bonus track on their subsequent release, though only on the Japanese version for some reason. The more 
interesting thing is found a little lower in the article, where they write up a track list for songs that may appear on the album. Most of these titles would end up becoming tracks on either this album or albums released afterwards, with two notable exceptions, One Chance and Mr. Lucky. Despite this early track list being used on official listings to purchase the self-titled album for some reason, both of these tracks did not appear on that or any album of theirs, and this article is the only reference to their potential existence I could find. I say potential because, well, MTV doesn't specify a source for this track list, so they could just be pulling these names out of their ass and we wouldn't have any clue. Either way, that's two more titles to add to the pile of Smash Mouth songs that never saw the light of day. And for a third, let's jump ahead a bit. In the years following the release of their 2012 album Magic, Smash Mouth would mainly focus itself on becoming a touring act, meaning that there are only really murmurings of new material being created by the band, with a handful of one-off singles that were usually collaborations with other artists. With that, whenever a glimpse into a new track was given, it was a decently big deal. In March of 2018, the Smash Mouth Twitter account posted a photo of themselves in the studio, with a lyric sheet for a song they were recording titled Dumb, and later on, a video clip was uploaded of the late Steve Harwell recording vocals for the song. Why fall in love? Love is blind. It blocks who? To date, this song hasn't been released by Smash Mouth, though it isn't technically lost, and fans of the channel know where I'm going by this point. In 2023, Greg Camp would join a new project filled with some of his 90s punk rock peers named The Defiant, and the band's first single would be this song, now under the name Dead Language. Why? The Defiant is its own separate, wacky story I'm kinda sad that this is associated with, but the song at least didn't completely go to waste. However, we do have video evidence of a Smash Mouth version of the track being recorded, so that version of the song would still be considered lost. Although, with the song already released by another band, and with members of Smash Mouth stating in interviews that they don't plan on releasing the recent stuff recorded with Harwell in favor of working with his replacement, Zach Goody, it's unlikely that Dumb or any other post-magic Harwell led tracks will see the light of day. And admittedly, this is just another one of me pointing out an unreleased song and calling it lost. Plus, with how the song turned out under the Defiant, I'm not sure if Smash Mouth would fare any better releasing a full version. Now those stories were both interesting, but now with those out of the way, we can get to the lost music that I'm personally really fascinated by. I mean, okay, there is also this lost live album that ties into something later, but we'll get to that anyways. As I explained before, Smash Mouth's fifth album, Old Habits, went through the musical equivalent of development hell, and had to be delayed several times before they got something they were happy with. But most people aren't aware that their next album, 2012's Magic, went through a similar situation. This one was caused by a number of factors, from key members of the band, and leaving early in production, or just the vision of the album not being concrete until much later. But the most interesting aspect to me is that the band also went on an unannounced semi-hiatus in between the album's production, so that Steve Harwell could pursue of all things, his dream of becoming a country music star. Multiple Smash Mouth members have attested that Steve grew out of Smash Mouth's surf punk style long ago, and was more interested in more standard pop and especially country music. And in late 2008, he decided to attempt a solo career in Nashville. I won't go too in-depth into this, since Steve Harwell's country music escapades could probably make a video all on its own. <laughs> that's not a hypothetical, that's a threat. But long story short, he spent almost three to five years writing with with a handful of other country singers in order to make his own solo country album, either titled LA to Nashville or All the Way Gone. A handful of singles were allegedly given to country radio, and Steve did many interviews in the country music press, and even attended the 2009 Country Music Television Awards to promote the release. The album was initially slated for a summer 2009 release, but that eventually came and went, with the release being delayed as far as November of 2011. With news on the record slowly drying up soon after, the prospect of the album 
film faded from the general public's mind, and its eventual release was left up in the air for some time. Now, me explaining all this doesn't mean the album is lost media, however, as in June of 2013, Smash Mouth's management company actually started uploading a ton of Steve Howell solo tracks to their SoundCloud page, including some that were confirmably from this album. So we still don't know if the record was ever released, or which one of these tracks were made for it, or just unrelated solo songs, but we at least have a decent chunk of Harwell's solo country material available to listen to. No, I'm telling you all this because despite the production on this album coming and going, Steve Harwell's country aspirations never fully left him. You can hear a bit of pop and country Steve coming through on Magic, but he also never gave up on making it solo either. In March of 2020, radio show 93.3 Eagle Country premiered a brand new Steve Harwell country single titled First Rodeo, a song that came with a handful of impressive guest performers, most notably featuring a guest verse by a then-underground folk rapper named Jelly Roll. Snippets of the song would also be heard in the following days on Smash Mouth and their management's Instagram pages, though unfortunately by some guy just phone recording his screen while Eagle Country plays. And the song would officially be released on the Smash Mouth YouTube channel on April 16th. Country girl, California ID. What you drinking, girl? This one's on me. However, for seemingly unknown reasons, this upload of the song would be deleted from the platform sometime after the beginning of 2021, with the full song being completely unarchived to this day. You may think this is a similar situation to Love is a Soldier, where Smash Mouth fans hated the new sound, but no, the track got a pretty typical reception, though albeit not a lot of attention in general. That's my best theory for why it was deleted, it just didn't garner as much buzz as the band had hoped. Which isn't the best reasoning for deleting your work off the face of the internet, and some for people wanting to learn about the band's history, but it's the most reasonable explanation we have for the time being. From what I can tell, most of the song is still available if you're willing to piece it together from those Instagram videos and snippets from the Eagle Country segment, but without a high-quality full version, there's no way to tell how these pieces fit together. And plus, it's frankly a really disappointing way of experiencing the song, instead of it just being available regardless of its performance. I personally don't care for more modern, poppier sounding country production, but from what I've heard most of Steve Harwell's solo material is pretty decent, and in my opinion his voice and personality fits modern country music better than a lot of the more recent Smash Mouth material starring him. So with that, it's kinda sad to see all this effort fade into obscurity, or sit in a vault for years, or for it to be lost to time and scrubbed from reality for no clear reason. It's not too disappointing, since that's sort of an inevitability for an over-the-hill act trying something new, but still, if I'm devoting this much time into this band, then it's something I gotta keep in mind. But you're the fans. You're the fans. Of course, actually releasing the music is realistically only a third of your job as a musician, with most of your time spent promoting your albums and performing live. There are a handful of interesting performances and video material from Smash Mouth that's been lost to time, along with some physical promotional stuff we'll get to a bit later. Obviously, there's a ton of mundane live performances said to be televised or recorded, but haven't been uploaded to the internet yet. But the one I want to highlight is a special television spot the band had all the way back in 1998. In August of that year, Year, an episode of the variety show Penn and Teller's Sin City Spectacular would air, featuring Smash Mouth as one of the musical guests. But of course, since this is a variety show, and since it's Penn and Teller, they aren't just gonna make them do a normal performance of one of their big songs. And naturally, some alleged coincidental shenanigans led to it becoming more interesting. According to reports, Smash Mouth was taping a performance of Walking on the Sun for the show, when somehow of all people, 60s British lounge singer and contender for funniest name Engelbert Humperdinck Dink walked in and decided to join in to do an easy listening version of the song. I guess we got another retooling of Walking on the Sun out there for us to find. I'd have two nickels and so on. Obviously, since it's in this video, this performance has gone unarchived, although this one kind of feels like cheating, since much like a surprising amount of Penn and Teller material, a large portion of this show is also currently lost. It does feel kind of weird to only be focusing on a single episode of something like this, when the story behind the show as a whole is something we won't even get into. Like, there's a hand handful of early 2000s behind-the-music-esque shows that are mostly lost to time that coincidentally have an episode with Smash Mouth in it, and I decided not to cover those since there isn't really any meat to the story if we only talk about the single episode related to today's topic. But I feel like the Penn & Teller performance is a marked exception, since it bringing us both an out-of-left-field collaboration like this and a wholly original version of a classic song is enough to give it a bit of its own amount of intrigue. Now when you think of promotional videos for 
musicians, your mind obviously goes to the idea of music videos. Fortunately for us, there aren't any Smash Mouth music videos that are lost in the traditional sense, at least that we know of. However, there is at least one that you'll have a hard time finding, at least for free. Another well-known piece of Smash Mouth lore is that one of the supposed reasons old habits got delayed was to try and cash in on a project Steve Harwell was involved with, a season of the VH1 Big Brother-esque celebrity house reality show named The Surreal Life. And a big piece of evidence for this is the fact that promotion for the album was baked directly into the show. Episode 2 of the season would see the gang tasked with helping Steve in filming a music video for Story of My Life, the then-upcoming single to Summer Girl I mentioned earlier. The video would be released publicly at the earliest in March of 2006 via MTV's website, two months before the episode aired in May, and it was linked by Smash Mouth as late as December of 2016, though sadly the link has gone unarchived and the video was lost in the shuffle due to a retooling of their site in early 2017. It was a bonus feature on VH1's website after the episode aired, but since most websites aren't fun anymore, it also isn't available there either. For what I'm presuming to be convoluted legal stuff involving VH1 and the band sharing the rights, the Story of My Life video is unlikely to be freely available through any official means anytime soon, though that doesn't mean it's completely inaccessible. The full Surreal Life series is available on Paramount Plus as of me writing this, so if you want to pay for a streaming service in order to watch a single Smash Mouth music video, then you can do that, I guess, since unfortunately the only way to officially watch the video is through this subscription. It's not like if you look for it right now, you'll find the music video ripped from the episode by me and preserved on the internet archive or anything, cause that's something I'd never stoop so low as to do. But yeah, obviously since I was talking about it here, I had to bite the bullet and watch the episode with the video in it, so I used a convenient free trial to watch the season and then immediately cancel my subscription. I will say, looking into a show like this is a real time capsule. You should definitely check out the show, even if you just want to see how bad reality TV was in the mid-2000s, cause man, you can just smell the over-sensationalism. Seeing how these kinds of shows were made in this decade makes me realize that older generations have no right calling what we watch brain rotting. And like most reality shows, you can definitely tell they really have to exaggerate every disagreement these people have for dramatic effect, but the offenses are usually so small that nothing ever really comes from it, at least within the episode. Like in the episode we're focusing on, the crew had a prop budget of about a thousand dollars, and they were really proud that they ended up going under budget. But when they get to the filming location with the props, Steve's disappointed that they didn't use all of the money, and the show makes it out like it's this big deal with the music stings and all the usual dramatic stuff. All the props <laughs> are so low budget. Why don't we spend all the budget? We didn't. Why not though? There is no need to just arbitrarily pick things and hope that we can use them somehow. Tony was like a dictator in the prop house. What an ass wipe. But then they just continue on with the episode and it's never brought up again. That feels more like a pacing issue, if anything, since they have to keep up the tension no matter what, but like, that's the best you guys could do? Although I will say that the show's portrayal of late trans actress Alexis Arquette was surprisingly respectful given the time, though I bet the producers would have done much worse with her if given the chance. If I'm being honest, I'm probably not that qualified to critique or analyze reality shows, especially as someone binge watching it off YouTube and 2024. For one, my irrational hatred of them might cloud my judgment, but more importantly, despite what I could talk about with what these say about that time's wider culture, shows like these execute on what they're attempting to be perfectly, which again is a platform for celebrities desperate to maintain relevance to opt into over-sensationalizing their interpersonal turmoil, so there's not much I can really say on that front. What I can say is that in spite of my introduction to the series being Steve Harwell, there was surprisingly little of him at the forefront front of this season, though there is a reason for that. A big reason why so much of the Steve-centric parts of the episodes are so underwhelming is because he purposefully didn't want to do much to attract attention to himself. More than a few years back, you were on VH1's reality show, The Surreal Life, where you lived in a house with Tawny Katayan, uh, Cece DeVille of Poison. What are your memories from that experience? It was horrible. <laughs> okay. And I, and I should have never done it, and I regretted it. I mean, the minute I got on there. According to Steve, he did enjoy making friends with the cast once he got there, but it took a lot of bargaining for him to accept the offer in the first place. It seems like the producers were under the impression that Steve was still the rowdy party animal that he was back during the band's peak, but by 2006, he had grown past a lot of that behavior. So that on top of him knowing how manipulative the reality TV industry can be, he was incredibly hesitant to join the show. I think for the most part, 
the producers of the show kind of thought I was still the crazy partier thief, and that's what they really want to get out of you. They want you to make a fool of yourself, basically, and I wouldn't do it. And it really pissed off the producers. I'm not going to make a fool of myself on national TV. And after watching the season, I can definitely see that shine through. Throughout most of it, even in the Smash Mouth-centered episode, Steve surprisingly doesn't get focused on that much in terms of conflict, unless he's backed into a corner. And even his other bandmates commented publicly that the Steve they saw in The Surreal Life was way more subdued than what they were used to seeing from him. What ultimately convinced Steve to star in the show was obviously a lot of money, which he says was a neat bonus, but wasn't the thing that truly motivated him to join. According to him, the real final straw was when the producers promised him a pilot for his own VH1 talk show if he went through with it. Steve, in interviews about it, seemed genuinely excited about the prospect of his own talk show, but from the way he tells it after he didn't do what they wanted on camera, the producers got angry and didn't go through with the pilot. One of the show's creators, Mark Cronin, however, saw the situation differently, saying that Steve was decently excited to appear on The Surreal Life and that it didn't take as much convincing as others claimed. He does indirectly confirm that a pilot was being thought of, though he also also says the real reason it fell through was because there was simply a lack of interest from higher-ups. Funnily enough, when I initially did the research for all this, I had yet to actually watch the season of the show he was on, so I was surprised to learn that the cast hosting their own talk shows was actually one of the challenges given to them in an episode. What they did was a bit more gamified and impromptu, so it probably isn't the best indicator of where a real Steve Horwell talk show would have gone, but I guess it's interesting to know that the idea of giving him a pilot in that format didn't come from nowhere. I bring all this up not because I consider this pilot lost media since it never left the idea stage, but mostly because, well, I thought it was neat and I watched a whole season of 2000s reality TV, so I deserve some compensation for it. But also that this isn't even the only hypothetical Smash Mouth TV pilot that we'd know about. I swear this is related, but in September of 2012, it was announced that Smash Mouth would be creating a cookbook titled Recipes from the Road, featuring some of their favorite dishes from local restaurants they found while touring and made with help from a few celebrity chef friends like Guy Fieri. The book was actually initially revealed to exist in June of 2011, but it wasn't until a blog post on SF Weekly that it got people's attention. And man, sometimes I forget how hated Smash Mouth was before the reappraisal after the memes. The book received a surprisingly cynical, at times hostile, response from publications when it was first announced. Mostly because, due to what I'll call recent events, both Smash Mouth and Guy Fieri's reputations weren't the greatest in wider culture in late 2012. But anyways, in one of those June 2011 interviews where it was announced, Steve Harwell also talks about a tie-in project for the book that was allegedly in the works. He claims that on top of the book, they had also recently finished filming the pilot for a Recipes of the Road TV show. The show was said to have a similar premise to Guy Fieri's show, Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives, where the band would visit restaurants, cook a few meals, and raise some money for these local businesses with performances and guest stars. I had a cooking show idea I've been working on, and then, you know, with our cookbook, Recipes from the Road, that we put out, a lot of my friends are in the business and chefs like Guy Fieri and all those guys. So, you know, he's always said, you know, you got to do a show, do a show. So, you know, he has some good ideas for it. We shot a sizzle reel for it. Came out really well. Pitching it to some networks. So, uh, he specifically states in the interview that filming had wrapped by the time this was published, and from how he talks about it, Steve was really excited about the idea, but unfortunately this one page is the only surviving reference to this pilot I could find anywhere, and the concept of another Smash Mouth TV show was never publicly considered again. This pilot is honestly something I'd love to see released someday, since besides the surreal life, which only barely counts, Smash Mouth surprisingly haven't had that many forays into television, although if you also sad no Smash Mouth food show exists, then fortunately you're in luck, since recently, for some reason, Smash Mouth have been uploading a series of local sandwich reviews to their official YouTube channel. So, in a way, the band still got to live out their Guy Fieri cable TV mukbang dreams after all of this time. And finally, we've got a few miscellaneous stories to cover, specifically a couple examples of physical media with dubious existence that I've learned about. And that means I can finally talk about that thing with the live album I brought up earlier. In November of 2001, a bit before they were set to release their self-titled album, MTV did report that the band was planning on recording a live album during their end-of-the-year shows. Obviously, since it's being brought up here, this album was never released, and their real first live album wouldn't come for another 15 years, but it's at least connected to something I found even more 
interesting. The article also says that the band hired a camera guy to record them backstage for what they only referred to as an upcoming DVD, with the group expecting the eventual footage to be edited by director and frequent Smash Mouth collaborator Mick G. And true to their word, in mid-2003, in preparation for Get the Pictures release, the band announced that the initial pressing for the record would come with a limited edition bonus DVD, advertised to contain, quote, a live concert film, an hour-plus documentary, ten music videos, five photo galleries, and a host of bonus features and extras. However, once Get the Picture actually released on August 5th, there wasn't any mention of a DVD coming with the album, and I have yet to find any evidence that this DVD was actually released physically, but just not mentioned anywhere due to the jump to digital music stores. The prospect of a product with that much behind the scenes, or at least supplemental material being silently forgotten, is honestly pretty disappointing. Especially since, to my knowledge, this particular era of Smash Mouth's time as a signed act is arguably the least readily documented. But segue time, speaking of documents... This is the official Smash Mouth biography book written by bassist Paul Delisle titled Walking on the Sun. It's a pretty neat find, it talks about the first two albums for about two-thirds of its length, and it uses the R slur three separate times, wouldn't have it any other way. Overall, it is an interesting first-hand account of the band's initial rise to success, which is kind of an overexposed period for them by this point, but whatever, it's still neat. I guess a book like this is also technically lost media since it hasn't been archived anywhere, but not really, since it's just kind of hard to get your hands on, and I've stretched the definition of lost media pretty thin in this video already. The reason I'm showing this to you is to point out a single detail on page 30 that really captivated me, and it's fitting that this is the last topic for this video, since it's the one I honestly think about the most, and it's pictured in poor print quality right here. This is the cover of Smash Mouth's first known appearance in a music magazine, the cover of the November 1996 issue of Bay Area Music. As the person you've seen that I am, you have no idea how hyped I was when I saw this picture when reading this book, since considering how important this magazine is to Smash Mouth's legacy, it's become my holy grail of Smash Mouth memorabilia. Like I said somehow over a half an hour ago by this point, after the demo for Nervous in the Alley hit it big on local radio, Smash Mouth were given an inordinate amount of attention for a newly established, unsigned band filled with nobodies. They were immediately swarmed by interested labels, they were set to play at high-profile concerts run by radio stations, and the most important personally for the band was getting on the cover of BAM Magazine, or Bay Area Music. There's a magazine called BAM Magazine in California. Yeah. It's like the big magazine there. They got, you know, wind of it, and then they, they put us on the cover of BAM. We're still unsigned, and we're shopping this thing. I'm going, who's gonna, you know, come on, you know. Yeah. I think it's somebody sign us now, you know. BAM was a bi monthly music publication started in the mid 70s, and over time it became the premier magazine for the California rock scene. If you were a local band, big or small, getting featured in BAM was the biggest sign that your efforts were beginning to pay off. Occasionally, BAM would have what they called a local band directory, where they would dedicate a section to showcasing upcoming acts. And even more occasionally, they would publish an edition dedicated to these underground artists with a local band special issue. With so many bands being spotlighted... spotlit? Focused on in a magazine like that, it would naturally be a big decision as to which band you wanted to have front and center as the issue's main selling point. So any act being picked for the front cover of this issue, or any issue for that matter, would mean a great deal for the trajectory of their career. Like here's an issue I found with Primus on the cover a year before they hit it big, so if there's any publication that could get your foot in the door, it would be them. From the things that I've read, the boys in Smash Mouth all had a lot of reverence for BAM, and although the cover story didn't immediately blast them into becoming superstars, it'd only be a year later when Walking on the Sun truly broke them through. And this issue gets commonly cited as the first big push towards getting as far as they did only a few years after forming. And for those curious, this naturally wouldn't be the last time Smash Mouth would cross paths with BAM. They would be on another cover of a May 1999 issue, which despite all this talk, I surprisingly still haven't bought for some reason. I don't have a problem. And they would win both Best Male Vocalist and Best Rock Album for Astro Lounge at the BAM-affiliated 2000s California Music Awards. A notable appearance since Steve shit-talked the guy from Third Eye Blind in one of his acceptance speeches, which is part of a whole other thing we don't have time for. So with all that context, you could see why I would want to get my hands on a copy of this BAM issue, if nothing else to own a little piece of history. But surprisingly, despite it being so significant to the band's rise, I've found barely any acknowledgement of this issue online 
online. You'd think one of the first public appearances of one of the biggest bands of the late 90s who had recently gone through a modern resurgence would be more sought after than this. But at least from what I've seen, besides passing mentions and biographies for the group, there's really nothing on the internet in terms of documenting this issue. No pictures or archives, not even a listing on any of the big online thing selling sites, nothing. We do know the cover photo was shot by frequent Smash Mouth photographer Jay Blakesburg as BAM staff photographer at the time through this cute Instagram post he made after Steve Harwell's passing, but in terms of details, that's all we really know. You can see why I got so excited when I saw this page in the book, since this was by far the biggest lead in my search for it, and it came from a place I in no way expected to see it in. And to my knowledge, me posting this video will make this page the first quote-unquote widely accessible image of this issue, and you can barely even see what's going on in it, so that tells you how much we're working with. Now, I'm fully aware that this is probably something only I'll be this interested in seeing concluded, and realistically, this is one of those mysteries that gets solved when some unrelated dude with a collection puts up a copy of the issue on eBay or something. But I think this is a pretty fitting final story to tell, both because it's one of the band's more obscure unarchived achievements, and one I've put a decent effort into solving, but also, more simply, that it's the earliest obscurity from Smash Mouth that we know about. I'm looking at my watch. It's no real mystery why lost media, especially those tied to beloved or cult classic cultural behemoths, garner so much attention. It's just within the indomitable human spirit to want the whole of a legacy preserved, either your own or someone you see as deserving. And more generally, whenever you dive into the intricacies of popular figures like this, there's bound to be things that slip through the cracks and get lost to time. Especially with an act like Smash Mouth, which frankly never had the kind of depth that appealed to enough of the right kind of rock fan to garner to a massive dedicated following. The main reasons bands get that kind of fanbase is either from them being more experimental or vulnerable than the rock that surrounded them, or just that they're seen as some sort of underdog story. The typical narrative for these kinds of bands are a group of scrappy kids with the passion to become musical auteurs, and their ideas intriguing enough to hook people even before they could jump the shark and release Beverly Hills, but Smash Mouth is a more unique case for music archival, since they didn't really toil in the under ground for ages before hitting it big like other bands from their time. They effectively immediately had their star quality recognized through knowing the right people and being in the right place at the right time, which means there's barely anything you could call a forgotten artifact of their debut. If anything, the time after their peak is the least documented aspect of their story, and their cultural decline and the more recent Twilight years seem to be where the most of their unarchived material comes from, and being hated by the public after their oversaturation and later only enjoyed, ironically, during the peak of meme culture probably didn't help things in that regard. I'm not explaining all this to make it seem like it's my duty to Google Smash Mouth too much, although again, I can stop myself at any time. It's mainly a way to point out that pretty much everything has hidden layers to it if you're dedicated enough to look for them, even in places you don't expect, like funny late 90s corporate surf rock bands. Plus, it's another reminder that learning about the subjects you're passionate about is a pastime all on its own that I encourage you all to take up, especially if it's about something that you feel has gone underappreciated or is rarely taken seriously. Or if that's too much work for you, just try to find the funny stuff no one knows about, so you can berate strangers about the Smash Mouth Guys solo country album until they don't want to sit next to you on the bus anymore. Looking back on the channel, it's kind of surprising how long it's been since I've made a video on something I've enjoyed, or at least making the video on the topic because I enjoyed it on the outset. So because of that, it was fun to be able to tell you guys these stories about a topic I was genuinely excited excited to cover, not in a schadenfreude way after I've researched it, but genuine appreciation. And like I said back in the intro, this video doesn't even cover all of the interesting Smash Mouth adjacent things I found in my research, so I'm not gonna bombard you all with that right away, but don't be surprised if you see them pop up every so often. Truth be told, it was also fun to make a video without any controversy or wacky politics in it. That stuff's also fun to analyze, but let's be honest, we all could use a break from that every now and again. Although now that I think about it, Smash Mouth have had their fair share of controversies, but again, stories for another day. But with that, thus ends my exploration into the lost and unreleased media related to the band Smash Mouth. I hope you enjoyed. And if disappointment haunted all of your dreams, then maybe like this video. And if you saw my face and now you're a believer, then maybe consider subscribing as well. And I'll see you all in the next video.